Uh, I was going to focus in tonight on controlling pests on high tunnel tomatoes. So, um, so my, my, my first slide is, you know, to manage pests, you have to know your pests. And so um, you have to identify them. And it's pretty easy to just say, Oh, you have to identify, you, you should be able to identify them. But you know, pests come in different stages. They, they, they change as they grow and develop. Uh, some of them go through complete metamorphosis and you know, they, 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 they end up in different places. You know, some of them are in the soil part, part of their life cycle, some of them up on the plant. And so uh, you really need to begin to learn how to recognize all of the common pests, not everything, if something unusual shows up, you take it to the county extension office, have them help you get it identified, but recognize all the common pests in all their stages. So where, wherever they're gonna show up, whatever they're gonna look like. And you should also be able to associate the type of damage you see with the insects that cause that damage. Because a lot of times uh, the, the insects may be uh, hidden, uh, and, and the damage is not hidden. So what you're gonna come across is the damage before you see uh, some of these high tunnel tomato pests. And so be able to associate that damage or signs of damage with the type of pest that's ca causing it. Also know how to monitor your, for your pests. E each one of the pests may have a different strategy we use to monitor for them. And you need to know how, how to monitor for them. So if you start to see some, you can begin to take counts throughout your high tunnel to see what the numbers are like uh, from week to week. Are the numbers going up? Are they going down? That's all really critical information you need to know. You also need to have an understanding of their life cycle. And what I mean by that is, you know, how long is their life cycle? Is it five days or five weeks? Uh, you know, what are the different stages? Uh, where are the different stages uh, going to occur? And the other thing you need to know about your pests are what are the control options? We have preventive controls and those have to be in place before the pests show up. Well, once they show up or once the crop is in the ground, a lot of those preventive controls may not be as effective. Uh, and then we have the, the controls we use to react to the pests. And a lot of times that's, that's with our insecticides and miticides. So, uh, what are the usual suspects? I mean, that, that goes back to that uh, Casablanca movie, you know, round up the usual suspects. But the, the usual suspects we have for high tunnels are going to be mites. And uh, th there's, there's several different species, uh, thrips, uh, a couple of different species, white flies, two different species, and aphids. Now, in reality, almost anything that shows up in the field can show up in the high tunnel. Uh, I mean, you can have Colorado potato beetle. Uh, you can have grasshoppers. I've seen those in high tunnels, but, but they're much less common. And they're also a lot out of sync with either the early part of the spring season with the high tunnel, or they're out of sync with the, the fall, uh, the late fall part of the, the high tunnel season in, in the late fall. Uh, a lot of these are, are going into some of their, their dormant stages. Uh, but things like mites, thrips, white flies, and aphids will continue to feed and reproduce uh, year round if the environment's right. And so uh, these tend to be some of our, our most serious pests in high tunnel. And you, you can see, I, I tried to put pictures there where you can see uh, examples of those pests. And so I don't know if you can tell on those tomatoes, but, but they have uh, some of the uh, flecking and they have the webbing and the, the spider mites all over those tomatoes. So early detection. It's so critical to capture or catch your insect problems in their earliest stage. Uh, you know, when you catch them early, it means you have more control options available. You have both biological and chemical control. You're catching them before the damage has really been inflicted. Damage and I use the word damage, meaning dollar loss has been inflicted. And uh, the early stages are easier to control. It all often takes a smaller dose of insecticide to kill a young stage of an insect than it does an older stage when it's gonna take a, a much bigger dose to be effective. 
you know, when we catch pest problems late, uh, you're managing heavy populations. There's often multiple life stages at once. Biological control is not practical at that time. Uh, the crop has been damaged. You, you've taken a hit in the pocketbook and you may need multiple chemical applications uh, to begin to reduce that problem. One of the biggest areas where I see people making a mistake is they don't monitor their high tunnel regularly and they tend to catch infestations when, when they're pretty well established and developed. They're not catching them as early as they should. So if, if there's anything I, I want you to take from this presentation tonight, go out there and monitor your high tunnel on a regular basis. And what I mean by that is a weekly basis. So know how to inspect your plants. Uh, you know, you need to inspect plants at random, not just, you know, five plants at one end of the tunnel that you go into every week, but you need to spread that, those plants out, look at plants randomly, and make those plants representative of the entire high tunnel. Uh, look at the undersides of the leaves. So you need to flip those leaves over, uh, look at the undersides. Uh, if you're my age, uh, you need to use a hand lens when you do that. Examine the bud area of the plant, and you may need to tap uh, some of the, the flower clusters over a piece of paper to, to look for thrips. Those are the standard techniques we use to inspect our plants. Always think sanitation. I know this is very much in line with uh, uh, what Dr. Gauthier uh, always says, you know, think sanitation, weed removal inside and out. You don't have pet plants in your high tunnel. You know, disinfect floors, pots, flats, you know, anything that goes in and out of the, the high tunnel needs to be disinfected. Uh, if, if you're uh, moving plants in, uh, you, you want to isolate uh, new, new plants. If you find plants that are infested, you have an opportunity to uh, isolate them. You know, if, if they're in bags, uh, you know, uh, on, on the floor uh, and you can, you can uh, isolate those, that would be good. If you have heavily infested plants, cull them out, uh, you know, rogue those plants, bag them up and, and take them out of the high tunnel. And, you know, clean out drains and other places around the high tunnel so you don't have uh, issues with standing water. And, you know, when it comes to weed removal um, in that lower picture, you can see it's not just in the high tunnel, but it's around the high tunnel as well. That, you know, better, better weed control around the high tunnel not only reduces harborage for diseases and insects, but it improves airflow and a number of other things as well. So yellow sticky cards, I'm a big advocate. They're cheap. They're effective. They uh, can uh, um, be used to monitor most of our uh, greenhouse pests. The only group that, that I mentioned that you cannot monitor with those would be the mites. Uh, you hang them just above the height of the tomato plants. So as the tomato plants uh, grow during the year, you can raise those uh, yellow sticky cards higher and higher. You check them every week. Uh, I recommend using uh, about five per, you know, 30 by 92 uh, high tunnel. Uh, that works out to, uh, you know, close to two per uh, thousand square feet in, in the high tunnel. Uh, I, I tend to be pretty frugal how I do things. And so when I check yellow sticky cards, if I see a few thrips on them, I'll bring a, a sharp pencil with me and I'll just circle those thrips. So the next week when I go back, I, I, if I see thrips that are circled, I know those are last week's thrips. They're not this week's thrips. So I can use the sticky cards for a few weeks in a row. Uh, when they start to get to look like that one in the upper right there, it's time to replace it. That, that one happens to be covered with uh, fungus gnats. So mites, let me start off with uh, pest recognition. Uh, mites, we have uh, different species. Uh, Probably the most common that we see in the high tunnel will be the two-spotted spider mite. It's favored by the drier conditions that we have in the high tunnel, the, the lack of rainfall. Um, and it, it, among the mites that we deal with, it is the elephant. Uh, it, it's the biggest one. I mean, th this one can, can reach such gargantuan levels of a half millimeter in size. So it, it, you know, you can see it with the naked eye. Uh, most people can, and uh, 
Uh, it, it's there in the upper right there. It can have two spots on the side. Sometimes they can be red. Sometimes they don't have those spots, but uh, th that's about the size. You can see what the egg looks like. It's that clearish, uh, per perfectly circular uh, uh, sphere right, right next to the uh, two-spotted spider mite. The, the damage that they cause, uh, you can see over on the left part of the screen, uh, those little tiny uh, spots on the leaves, we call that stippling. That's where they remove the cell contents from individual cells. They'll also do that to the fruit and you get some of that speckling, that fine speckling on the fruit. Uh, they're called spider mites because they will make a web. So they leave webbing where they go. Uh, the next uh, mite we have is the broad mite. And that's that second picture down on the right. Uh, you can see uh, these are uh, about less than half the size of a spider mite. So we're, we're talking about, uh, well, very small. Uh, the eggs are there, they're, they're clear. They have those white uh, patches on them. I think they look jewel-like almost when I look at them underneath the microscope. Uh, many people can see these with their naked eye. I cannot, uh, I can see them quite well with a microscope, uh, but, but they're very small. The big problem with this uh, broad mite is that their saliva is toxic. And why that is important is it takes a lower number to do damage to the plant than it would with uh, spider mites or with russet mites. So uh, they can be very damaging. They tend to congregate up in the bud areas and the protected areas of the plant. Uh, you can see what some of the, the damage looks like. Uh, you can see some discoloration, some uh, uh, poor growth on the plant. Uh, the bud area can have some uh, physical damage to it. You can have some darkening of, of the leaves as well with that. Uh, the last mite we have is the russet mite. These are the smallest of the mites. Uh, they're um, minute is to say the, the, the least. Uh, some people say they can see it with a uh, 14X hand lens. It, uh, I need to look at it at 40X to 100X uh, to see these mites. But once you see them uh, and you have a problem, you see that the whole leaf is just covered with those mites. The, uh, the picture I have for the russet mite up there shows the damage to the tomato. That's a fairly well-established uh, infestation when you start to notice the fruit damage. Usually what you see earlier is uh, necrosis to the leaves, and you see this bronzing of the stems. Uh, it's almost a, a greasy bronze look to the stems. It's, it's not that uh, vibrant green color that you normally see on the stems. Uh, when I'm scouting for them, if I do see an infestation and I treat for it, one of the things I do is I take an ink, ink pen and I, I mark where the edge of that bronzing is. And that way, when I uh, spray in uh, minocide, I can see if I got good control or if that area is continuing to expand on the plant. So this, this is just a, a little fact sheet or, or fact table with mites. You know, it, com it compares uh, some different things with their biology. Uh, for example, two-spotted spider mites and broad mites have extremely wide host range, whereas the tomato russet mite is restricted to solanaceous plants for the most part. You can compare the sizes anywhere from a half a millimeter to uh, almost a tenth of a millimeter in size, so almost dust-like. Uh, their, their life cycle is very short. You can see some of these, it can be as short as five days. Uh, and you know the upper end is, is almost two weeks, and that's under very cool conditions. They move around on the wind. You know, spider mites will. Uh, make a little thread that they get blown around with. Uh, they can move on your clothing as you go from plant to plant. Plants that touch each other, uh, they, they can move uh, across plants like that. And then uh, the uh, tomato russet mite, they'll actually, uh, they're so small, they gather up at the top of the plant and just wind in the greenhouse uh, will move these. They, they don't make a thread or anything like that. They're just small enough to be carried on the breeze. You see that the miticides vary quite a bit. That's why it's important to identify um, what, what your mite species are. 
because these three mites actually come from three different mite families. They're not that closely related. And the miticides we use vary quite a bit by the type of, of mite that you have out there. So anything, uh, two-spotted spider mites, uh, most miticides will control them. When we have broad mites, you know, we're, we're getting down to agromech, portal, and pylon. And with tomato russet mite, it's really agromech and oberon that we can use uh, in the greenhouse. Uh, in terms of organic controls, you, I, I list some of those. Uh, summer oils, neem, pyganic, insecticidal soap for spider mites, summer oils for broad mite. And then for russet mite, uh, wettable sulfur has been used. We do have uh, biological controls for each of these. Um, and I'll, I'll be very candid with you. Since we're dealing with high tunnels, we drop the walls, we often open up the ends on, on the high tunnel. I have a, uh, a prejudice towards predatory mites. And the reason is they don't have a wing stage. They're not gonna fly out your windows. They're gonna stay on the plants. A lot of those other biological control organisms, unless you screen uh, on the edges of the high tunnel and, and screen the ends, uh, when you open up the, the sides, the, many of them are gonna fly out. And, but the predatory mites are, are, are stuck there, so they're gonna feed on those plants. Uh, you know, using some of these is as simple as hanging sachets in your plant. So it, it, they're, they're pretty easy to uh, inoculate a greenhouse or it's, it's sh like shaking uh, salt on, onto your uh, evening meal. You just shake that onto the plants. Thrips, the next group I want to talk, talk about, uh, they're also very common on high tunnel tomatoes. They're very small, only about a 25th of an inch in length. Um, they can be more common in spring crops following a mild winter. Uh, they do well uh, when we do have mild winters. Uh, many of the, my, the thrips we deal with have uh, high levels of insecticide resistance. Uh, their life cycle is a little bit longer, so egg to adult in about 19 days. But they also have some hidden stages. So the eggs are actually deposited inside plant tissue and the pupae and pre-pupae actually move down to the soil. And so uh, there, there's a couple of stages that are not exposed to insecticides or, or miticides. Uh, and then they, they, they come back out after they pass through those stages. And they're also uh, vectors of some viruses. And what I mean by a vector is they're carriers of viruses and they're viral vectors, particularly for uh, uh, tomato spotted wilt virus and impatience necrotic spot virus. And so not only do they cause damage to the plant themselves, but they're also uh, uh, potentially carrying some, some viruses. Oh, I, I should mention in this last photo, you can see the, the, the typical signs of damage. You, you get these silver flecks on the leaf, and then you get these little tar spots. That's their waste material that they leave around. It looks a little bit different than a disease in that, you know, a lot of times with disease, you'll see the, the the dark spots within those damaged areas, but with the, the thrips, they're, they're associated with those damaged areas, but not necessarily in those, those damaged areas. They also damage the fruit. So down on the bottom right there, you can see the gold flecking, that's from their feeding, their, their piercing sucking uh, mouth parts, uh, but they also can create some scars in the fruit with their egg laying. So if you have very high numbers and they're doing some egg laying on the fruit, uh, that they can damage the fruit as well, particularly uh, noticeable when the fruit begins to color up. So how we sample for thrips in the high tunnel, uh, thrips are highly attracted to bright colors. They love yellow. That's why yellow sticky cards work so well. Uh, so one way to sample for them since they're so small it, and they're hidden in the buds and flowers is to tap those flower clusters over a white piece of paper uh, with the, the, the contrast and color, even I can see them running around on the, the white piece of paper. So it's a, it's a real good way uh, every week to go out and sample the thrips, particularly after the plants have begin to, begun to produce flowers. The other thing, because they're highly attracted to colors, uh, I recommend that when you work in your high tunnel, you wear drab uh, colors, uh, you know, browns and tans and things like that. Uh, blue jeans that, that are old and faded uh, are much better than those, those really bright colors because you can potentially carry thrips from outdoors inside the high tunnel on your clothing. 
in terms of uh, uh, thrips, uh, uh, insecticides, how well they perform. This is some IR4 uh, work, and you can see that uh, uh, Agrimec is, is a uh, top product along with uh, Pylon and uh, Venom and Torac as being some of our best greenhouse uh, uh, miticides. We have some other miticides for the field, uh, but we cannot use those in the greenhouse or, or in the high tunnel. So these are our top uh, high tunnel uh, thrips insecticides. Next group I was going to mention was the white flies. Uh, we really have two white flies. Uh, when I first came to Kentucky, uh, we were dealing just with the greenhouse white fly. Uh, that has really been, for the most part, displaced by the silver leaf white fly. And you can see that they do look a little bit different. Uh, that, that little smaller picture I have below the main pictures, that's what their, uh, their nymphs look like on the undersides of the leaves. And so they're lemon colored, flattened nymphs that, that don't move, they just sit on the leaf and they feed with their piercing sucking mouth parts. Uh, when they're done feeding, uh, they turn into a pupa and then the adult uh, crawls out of that, uh, that shell. And then you see the adults there. One small difference, and again, it, this isn't 100% because there's a lot of overlap, but the, the silver leaf does hold its wings a little bit different than the, uh, the greenhouse white fly. It holds the wings a little more vertical. And oftentimes you can see a space between the wings and the, then the greenhouse white fly uh, in general holds it a little bit more flat. But the, um, it's, it's much easier to identify the, the nymphs than the adults. And you can see with the, the greenhouse nymph, it has a fringe of hairs going around the body. And really that uh, silverleaf white fly nymph is bald. I mean, it, it has a couple of, of long hairs, but that's about it. So the, they're very different in, in appearance. Where you're gonna find uh, white flies, always on the undersides of the leaf. And I mean, always on the undersides of the leaf. If you're not flipping over leaves, uh, or brushing against plants, you're not gonna see the white flies. So uh, they complete their life cycle uh, in less than a month. Uh, they do produce honeydew. And what honeydew is, is the, the sugar in the plant sap. So they, they literally just leak this onto the leaves below their colonies. Uh, and I actually use it as a good scouting tool. If I know there's some white flies in the high tunnel, and uh, I've, I've seen them on the, the sticky cards. I'll look on the plants to see if I can see any honeydew. And then if I see some honeydew on some leaves, I flip over the leaves above that, uh, looking for the white flies. Uh, white flies can stunt the plants. Um, they, they, uh, the silver leaf can also cause some irregular ripening issues on some heirloom tomatoes, and there's some examples of that. Uh, they're also disease vectors. They can transmit some viruses of, of tomatoes. And so uh, just like the thrips, uh, they're, they're, they're carriers of those viruses. Uh, this is an example of a, a extreme uh, injury to tomato plants uh, from thrips. You see the yellowing, you, you see the, the uh, white flies have been stuck to the, the leaves and that's because the leaves were covered in honey, that sticky honeydew. And then we had sooty mold that began to develop on that uh, honeydew. Uh, and so all, all signs that there, there's a serious uh, uh, white fly issue in the high tunnel. So in terms of uh, management, you know, start with a clean high tunnel, uh, no, no debris left behind, uh, no weeds in or around the, the high tunnel, uh, you know, a, a fallow period. Uh, you know, if you're bringing uh, transplants in, inspect those new plants to make sure they're, they're, fr they're free uh, uh, of, of insects, you know, mites in, as well as insects. In terms of monitoring uh, yellow sticky cards, uh, they're, they're very effective. Uh, plant inspection, uh, what I like to do is I'm going through the high tunnel. You know, if you, if you have your plants on a string from the, uh, the bars above, uh, or you have them in, in the floor to weave. I like to, to tap some of the posts, tap some of the spring, strings and see if I can get white flies to fly out of the plants because they're very sensitive and they will fly pretty easily. Uh, I also will flip over some of the mature leaves 
Some of the youngest leaves don't have the white flies on them. Usually I go down midway on the plant is where I start flipping over the leaves looking for the, uh, the white flies. In terms of biological control, we, we have some very good ones. I like the wasps, the Incarcia formosa, and the Rhett maceris. Uh, they're very effective. But one of the disadvantages is if you don't have a screened uh, high tunnel, uh, they will leave the high tunnel. Um, and so uh, they are winged uh, and, and that, that can be a, a problem. In terms of insecticides, and this is for the silverleaf whitefly, which is more insecticide resistant. The, these are our best high tunnel uh, insecticides. Uh, there's one there that you may not recognize. Uh, Altus is relatively new. Uh, there, was a, there is a similar field insecticide that was not permitted in the greenhouse. That was Savanto. Altus is the counterpart that is allowed in the high tunnel. And it provides some of our best efficacy against, the, against this white fly. By the, way, by the way, Altus can be used as a foliar or a systemic uh, application. Uh, but we also have in Meyer, uh, Courier, which is an insect growth regulator, uh, Distance, which is an insect growth regulator, and Exeril uh, are also very good uh, materials and, and venom as well. So uh, and you notice I put the Iraq classes there, and we really have a variety of insecticides from different classes. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that the life cycle is about one month. What I recommend is if you have to make multiple applications for white flies, every month you rotate to a different uh, mode of action class, a different Iraq group. And so what we, do, we do have a lot available to help manage resistance, and resistance will be a problem with white flies. Last group I was gonna mention real quickly are aphids. Aphids, uh, uh, they're, they're really bizarre insects out there. Um, they're, they're asexual. Uh, what you're dealing with in the greenhouse, uh, most likely there are no males, they're all females and they're giving live birth to more females. Uh, short generation time, that can be as short as six days. Uh, they produce honeydew just like the white flies because they feed with their piercing sucking mouth parts. Uh, and, and in some instances, they'll even draw ants uh, in, into the uh, high tunnel and the ants are there to tend the aphids and harvest the honeydew. So in terms of aphid management, uh, again, we need to control weeds in and around the high tunnel, uh, inspect new plants moving into the high tunnel, uh, manage nitrogen levels. Uh, Dr. Rudolph mentioned this. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, High nitrogen levels will actually increase the fecundity of some aphids. It, it almost acts like a fertility hormone uh, for these aphids, and it can really increase the, uh, how, how quickly their populations develop. Uh, we monitor, monitor for them uh, with yellow sticky cards and plant inspection. And so when I inspect plants for aphids, I look for honeydew. I pay particular attention to the bud area of the plant in and around the bud areas, uh, even on those suckers coming off on the, on the sides and on, on the undersides of, of leaves. They really like those bud areas because that's better uh, nutritionally for them uh, than some of the older leaves. Uh, in terms of biological, biological control, we have some great biological control organisms, lady beetles, lacewings, and wasps that work extremely well. They've been proven for uh, I think uh, uh, 70 years now. Uh, the one downside is with unscreened high tunnels, uh, they tend to fly away. Uh, we do have uh, systemic and contact sprays to manage aphids. Uh, this is just an example of what biological control of aphids looks like. These are uh, uh, aphids that have been killed by a wasp and they have little holes in the back of them and that's where the wasp has completed its development and uh, emerged from what we call the mummies on the leaf. So, you know, what I recommend, go through your high tunnel once a week. Uh, I, I talked to you about how to monitor for those different pests. I talked to you about what they look like. Uh, the important thing is, is when you get done monitoring, you write it down. Uh, I know if I don't write it down, I am gonna forget it, but write it down, make a map, keep records, 
Uh, you'll be able to see, you know, how, how do my problems this year compare to last year? Are they earlier or later? Are my problems worse or better than they were last week? Uh, do it every week. Have the same person go through each week and do it because different people will catch different things. And it's hard to compare scouting from one person to the next. So have one person do it consistently. Uh, I recommend to bring reading glasses or hand lens when you do it. And try, try and uh, scout the plants the same way every week. And I, I tend to like to look at uh, groups of, of uh, uh, three plants at a time, and I'll do five plants in a bay. Uh, the other thing I recommend is that you do it the same time every week. And the reason why I say that, if you don't have a fixed time, a lot of times you don't get around to it. And so I like doing it, you know, 10 a.m. Tuesday morning. I know that that's what I have to do 10 a.m. every Tuesday morning. When, when I tell myself that, I get it done. If I just wait till I have some free time, it never gets done. So in terms of high tunnel management, uh, one, one aspect is pesticide management. Uh, and so you may want to think preventive versus reactive. We have some uh, systemic treatments. For example, I mentioned the Altus. Uh, it provides systemic control of aphids and whiteflies. Has, you know, as a, a foliar or a systemic, it only has a one day pre-harvest interval. Uh, very effective, can be used preventively. preventively. Uh, I, I probably would not recommend that when you uh, set, set the plants in the high tunnel. I may wait a few weeks uh, to use that just so you get more extended control uh, up through the, uh, the, the fruiting part of the, of the season. Uh, I do recommend to consider using uh, something like neem on a weekly application. And, that, and that, the reason why I say that is it will slow down the development of pest and mite uh, populations. And neem, you're not likely to see any resistance development. It's an organically approved spray. Uh, and I, I think it's just going to help to uh, ma manage some of those problems. Uh, think about calibration and application. Uh, you know, the, the sprays you put on are only as good as how well you put them on. So they need to be calibrated correctly. They need to be put on at the right time against the right uh, pest stage, those types of things. And so uh, I, I, you know, I like to calibrate a few times during the year. Uh, pesticides are expensive. Uh, I don't think anyone will argue with that. And so let's make sure we're, we're putting them on correctly. Think about adjuvants that, that you can use with some of these sprays. And so uh, a lot of the insecticides that just stick to the outside of the plants, things like, you know, neem and some of the pyrethroids like, you know, Brigade and Mustang Max, they do well with stickers. Others like Admire and uh, Altus and, and some of these other that that penetrate into the plants or the stickers will actually prevent them from penetrating. And you wanna use something that will help them penetrate into the plant. And again, the adjuvants part of the label will tell you what to do. Uh, and again, rotate your modes of action. Each of these pests in the high tunnel, it has been more prone to resistance development. And lastly, Dr. Gaucher had her disease triangle while I'm presenting my insect triangle. So. This is, this is my insect triangle, scout weekly, keep written records, uh, use all preventive controls. Uh, in the high tunnel, a lot of those are gonna be sanitation. Uh, get your samples properly identified and always read and follow label directions.